Stepping Stones to Awareness. Gordon is live up north via Skype. Gordon, welcome to Stepping Stones. We're looking down the MP's rabbit hole and we're looking at money laundering and the City of London. Now, Gordon, you were in the RAF, you were an engineer, and you then started work in South Africa privately after you left the RAF. You got involved in investigating some sort of venture capitalist fund. And you, in your words now, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Thanks for the invite. Um, <clears throat> yeah, basically, um, my new partner uh, invested in a capital venture scheme, um, the life savings, fifty thousand dollars. Not not big in the in the banking sense, but uh, when when it developed further in investigation, there were many others, hundreds of others. Uh, involved and we employed two attorneys of law to do the money trail which went to Austria and the city of London and it was through their dossiers which were presented to the South African police and the Scorpions who were the anti-corruption police because of the names involved on the paperwork and they included a gentleman called Christoffel Petrus Dutoy, um, who was an ex-High Commission diplomatic intelligence officer with quite a history um, in the civil uh, recovery of other people that he defrauded. So we had a, a high political link to the old naughty apartheid regime when these people had free reign and were working quite closely with people in the city of London. And that was what drew my attention to other people, including the security services, a guy called Hannes Venter, who was also on the paperwork, and he was also working with the intelligence services. So this wasn't just a normal fraud with uh, people just trying to make a few quid. These were very highly organized um, intelligence officers who were operating out of the city of London. And this high and commissioner, where was he? was he? He wasn't British then, but he was no, working out uh, of the city. <clears throat> With a name like Christoffel Petrus du Toy, um, I would take the average person to say, <laughs> no, he's not, British, not Welsh. And he came from just north of Pretoria. Yeah. Right. A naughty man. A naughty man. He was involved through my research training Jonas Savimbi's uh, rebel army with another woman, an intelligence, Russian-trained intelligence officer called Ayanda Dlodlo. And I found out later on that they were, she was working with a bunch of fraudsters who stole my partner's cash. So she lost $50,000? Yeah, their life savings. Right, um, which is serious <coughs> stuff for anybody to lose all their all their proceeds, all their money. So, City of London, you went. Did you then return to the UK? No. What happened? We employed two attorneys of law to do the money trail. They presented a dossier to the Scorpions because when one or uh, more people are involved, it becomes a criminal offence, not just a civil recovery. And then the Scorpions had it for about 18 months and they found uh, they had dead ends. And then I, um, I did my own research and found out uh, the head of operations was working with the main fraudsters. So <laughs> I knew we were on a dodgy trail, so to speak, being ex-military myself. And uh, we received threatening phone calls and a certain intelligence officer rocked up at our restaurant, which we owned, and provided me with a 21-page file, which included the names of those people I was stepping on their toes, um, and threats to return back to the UK, which we did. Right, so you returned back to the UK, and, but you continued digging in the City of London, or how did Finchley Road come about? Well, because the, the paperwork for the investment included uh, all the, the money mule, 
uh, and an accountant, Mr. Dow van der Merwe Volun, and he's related to the Volunes of the old apartheid government. So I knew this wasn't just a normal fraud. This this was high-ranking um, individuals linked to the apartheid regime. So then I used the paperwork of the companies involved, and they launched out of five Harley Place, Harley Street, a company called Smallfield Cody & Co. and Smallfield Secretaries. And by my research, looking at those individual accountants and auditors, they had 113 companies that all came out of a certain address. In Harley Street? Yeah, no, the, the 113 companies that were linked to the two companies that um, defrauded my partner and many others came out of an original address at 788-790 Finchley Road. And it was my research of that address which led me to many politicians, and I include Tony Blair, David Mackenzie, Donald Mills, Silvero Bellasconi, the Mafia, Amber Augusta Rudd, and many other politicians which I could name, but for the moment I will keep quiet. But it's all in our my research. It's all documented as in the best forensic documents that you can get is via company's house. They tell no lies. Wow. Every director, every director of every company, if you want to do the research, out of 788 790 Finchley Road, there were 209,000 shell companies. And from my research, which I've done over 17 years, it shows that this is the biggest organized crime system in the world. So this basically, is, some of these MPs are actually serving MPs, aren't they? Yeah, oh, they, they are. I mean, I include, when I confronted him, Andrew Griffiths, uh, the, the man that's been caught sending uh, vile text to ladies, a conservative one. Um, yeah, people, people don't understand how to do deep research is to, um, as an engineer, is to look at the mechanics of how you move vast amount of money to Panama, which brought in my attention uh, to the recently exposed Panama Papers. I mean, they were 10 years behind me because I named them 10 years ago. What about the Lux Papers? Are you familiar with those as well? Well, I've, d I've researched many of the companies as exposed in the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. And that's where I said I'm 100% correct. They're, they're, uh, I mean, I do have credibility with French anti-money laundering experts who got rid of Europe's fourth most powerful woman, a woman called Miss Anne Laverone, who was a an executive of Arriva Nuclear France. Um, yeah, so I've got five years of correspondence with French anti-money laundering experts where I have been congratulated and thanked uh, for my passing of information. So this, um, is, this is quite convenient, isn't it? Because, I mean, we're talking about, we've been talking about Brexit an awful lot and, and we've got problems yes. with the MPs um, and them listening to the, the will of the people. And so you're, you've uncovered serving MPs who presumably are under the uh, watchful eye of the whips so they are doing as they are told. And then we've also got Brexit businessmen who are also mentioned in the Panama Papers, if I seem to recall correctly. Is that right? Well, well many, many politicians are named uh, using them for tax avoidance and others, uh, famous people, Sir Alex Ferguson, uh, the Beckhams. I, I named them in a company... Uh, which was a film company, um, which was recently exposed by many of the major media. But people are not looking at how you dismantle uh, money laundering or tax avoidance to the extent of identifying the paper trail, which, as an engineer, I'm quite good at looking at blueprints of complex military equipment and 
uh, high-cost civilian equipment. So when I looked at um, the Panama Papers, everybody is pointing a finger at an office in Panama called Masek Fonseca, when actually they should be looking at Envision House in Hitchin, because that's where Masek Fonseca came out of. Not, not in Panama, that's just a sub-office. And out of the same address is RM Nominees Limited. And then you start to get down the sticky wicket of looking down the rabbit hole, which I've gone right down. I know all the faces. I know all their conduit addresses. So I know how they've moved hundreds of billions out of this country covertly. And those people, they, although a lot of the newspapers have named some of these um, highfalutin uh, stars like the Beckhams, they've not looked at the mechanisms of how they were conduiting the money out. You can steal billions and all you need is a pen. However, it's the moving of it that becomes quite complex. And you've got to look at the conduits of how they move the money out. And that's what I've understood over much of 12, 14 years. I've identified the facilitators who uh, action and move the money. And these are the people that need to be exposed, which is what I'm doing. So we're looking at very famous people. We're looking into um, parliamentarians. We're looking at businessmen. And we've got a situation. We've got health crisis, NHS health crisis for funding. We've got various funding issues in the councils. We can't, you know, we can't look after our elderly. And yet all these people, like you mentioned, the Beckhams, are taking their money and now they don't call them tax avoidance schemes do they no it's uh, in investment in the film industry which people are uh, um, uh, ingenious film partners llp and ingenious film partners to llp uh, the two companies that i named where there's a direct retraceable link to finchley road <laughs> I said, it, it takes time to understand the mechanics of how they interlock to common addresses. But once you see the common addresses, you can then do a overview, like a planned view of who's involved and who have, who's facilitated the movement of those funds. But These none of this is legal, or is it legal? I, I'd say it is legal, but... The, the, the problem arises where these facilitators have been allowed because of who they're dealing with to get away with it. Much the same as I reported it to my uh, local MP, who was uh, a, a Labour MP, Chris Williamson, Derby uh, North. I reported it to him about Finchley Road many, many times. He refused to act on it to get us an appointment with... Um, Boris Johnson at the Foreign Office to expose South African intelligence officers using the City of London to move stolen funds from investors from all over the world. And he refused to do that. And I know why he refused to do it. Because when you check his um, parliamentary interests, uh, that is people who sponsored him, I found out that he was sponsored by UCAT, which is a, a labour union was a labor union and a sub uh, subsidiary company of UCAT was called UCAT Investments Limited and guess where that came out of 788 790 Finchley Road so no wonder he wouldn't do it and no wonder he's he should be uh, brought before the courts or brought before a police investigation to explain why he wouldn't expose Amber Augusta Rudd who has many companies that launched out of that same address. Did you mention the name Rudd? You mean as in Amber Rudd? I certainly did. Yeah, Amber Augusta Rudd. I checked her full biography and history of mining companies in on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And that's my expertise, is looking at um, cash-gutted companies that operate on the Toronto Stock Exchange the South African Stock Exchange, the Australian ASX, and uh, the UK AIM, which is the alternative investment market. 
And that's why I launched Pandora's Box Investigations to help investors who have lost hundreds of millions. And they don't realize what it's all about. It's nothing to do with mining, nothing to do with oil and gas. It's all about stealing money, vast amount of money, and moving it to offshore accounts. So, let me get this clear. People like Rudd and the Beckhams, are they, are they actually shareholders of these corporations? They, they were actually non-executive directors and, and senior executives of mining companies, which all eventually ended up as cash-gutted companies. But nobody would uh, investigate them under the auspices of it being uh, Ponzi scams because they've got so many people in their back pocket who were then even members of the Financial Services Authority and uh, thereafter Financial Conduct Authority and serious fraud office. <laughs> how, how do you beat the system when they've got it all marked? How so do you beat it? The Financial Conduct Authority is... It's the top of the top of the tree, isn't it? Shouldn't oh, they? I'd, I'd say the serious fraud office was the top of the tree, and to understand how um, the SFO was then uh, under the certain lead, leadership. If I can just uh, switch over here, um, I don't know if you can see that. Right, there's no addresses on there, are there? Well, it's it's um, the biography of Barbara Mills, Dame Barbara Mills. Right. Uh, deceased. It's to look at why um, the brother-in-law, David Mackenzie Donald Mills, was never prosecuted in the United Kingdom for setting up front companies for Silvero Berlusconi and the Mafia. So who is David? So he was an MP, was he? David Mackenzie Donald Mills it was the brother-in-law of Dame Barbara Mills and, I believe, um, looking at my research, and she was promoted uh, uh, to an appointment at the SFO by none other than Tony Blair. And Tony Blair then moved her to the SFO and she reluctantly refused, uh, no, sorry, I'd say reluctantly, she refused to investigate David Mackenzie Donald Mills when he was convicted in the Italian courts of setting up front com companies out of 788 790 Finchley Road for Silvero Bellasconi and the Mafia. So That's not to if say he was that. prosecuted in the Italian courts, was he actually yeah. imprisoned in Italy? Oh, no, no, no. He got away with it. He refused to go. And so under the time period, he managed to evade uh, uh, the custodial sentence um, by staying away, and then it, under the time lapse period, it, it was all chucked out. Very clever, but in this country, where, uh, uh, like myself, as an ex-serviceman, I was I was completely uh, gutted when I found out what I found out in South Africa, who was involved with the people that stole my partner's money, and I include our uh, ex-Tory. Prime Minister, um, Mrs. Thatcher and her son. They were being wined and dined by the same people who stole my partner's money in a Johannesburg hotel. That's oh, of course, he did five. have business links down there, didn't he? Oh, he had more than business links when he was he was convicted of aiding and assisting in the Sierra route. Uh, sorry, in um, the uh, the. Uh, the case where Simon Mann was jailed, um, if you remember that one. Simon, Simon Mann. He was arrested with a load of mercenaries in Zimbabwe. Yep. And locked up for setting out to do a coup. Um, but, Mark, that while we were there, the, the trials were being held in South Africa, and he was convicted, but... Got his mummy got him off. Um, Margaret Thatcher got him off. Yeah, she right. paid a fine, and then he had a suspended sentence. What's happened to him now then? Well, he's probably in Monaco, l lapping it up, doing so some covert dealing. So, have you made an estimate of how many MPs you reckon are actually involved in money laundering shell companies? 
Well, that's for Pandora's Box Investigations book that will be coming out. Uh, we and I say I'm not afraid to name the names. I've named Amber Augusta Rudd. Uh, I've named Chris Williamson MP. I, uh, Andrew Griffiths. I could I say I could go on and on. It, it's just it's a dirty world politics. There needs to be as an ex serviceman. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be honour, trust, integrity, and there needs to be accountability. Uh, they've got away with it because it's a it's a club. And we're not in it, unfortunately. Well, I mean, you know, the disinformation from the mainstream media insofar as getting Brexit is concerned, Brexit is, is just smokescreen and mirrors. You've got all this corruption going on. You've got all the deals going on behind closed doors with the military unification, uh, the trade deals, which obviously some of the MPs must have vested interests in. So it's a case of, hmm, sit back, take a look at the bigger picture and think, why is that MP uh, looking favourably in this particular sector or that particular sector? Are they being lobbied? Have they got personal vested interests? What, like Peter Lilly or uh, how about, um, uh, well, I could name a few more, but uh, there's the governor of the Falkland Islands. You know, I could, I could name so many. Look at the Falklands. Uh, five companies in the Falklands. Desire Petroleum, Falkland Oil and Gas, Rock Upper Resources, Argus Exploration, Border and Southern. They've cash burned £1.5 billion. And do you know what? how much oil have they found? Not a thimbleful. They all claim that they've crossed magnetic uh, researched and drilled with semi-submersibles. In 20-odd years, they haven't found enough oil to fill a can in a garage forecourt dustbin. So they're basically collecting investors' money and then <laughs> siphoning it off. Yeah, yeah, that's what they're doing. And um, I don't know how, who was handing out the Del Boy certificates at the SFO, um, maybe uh, Inspector Clouseau, um, but they, they need to be brought to account. They, the, the main thing that hurt me as an ex-serviceman, I came out of the RAF on the Christmas day, 1981, I came out. And shortly after that, that's having served for 12 years of a service contract. So I came out on Christmas day. Um, and shortly after that, we entered war in the Falklands to retake the Falklands. And it really hurts me that Sir Rex Hunt, as the governor of the Falklands, when you check his directorships, you will find out how many companies he's a director of in the Falklands which haven't found any gold, any silver, any oil, and nobody gives a damn. But I tell you what, I give a damn, because a lot of the victims, the people that invested in those Falkland oil and gas companies were Falkland's veterans. Now, they lost a shed load of money. So you've I'm, got I'm, Falkland they, veterans who live in the UK. Yes. Um, that have basically potentially lost their life savings investing yeah. in oil and gas on the Falklands. Yes. And then, you know, we've had Dave Ellis on the show and he's been highlighting, putting a spotlight on the fact that our military has been given away to Brussels. So it's a bit of a double whammy, isn't it, for, for veterans? And it's about time that all these issues were really exposed, especially to these particular people. Well, it's if you did it en masse it's too much you go over everybody's head that's right what i'm say what i'm saying is that you take company by company and look at them and dismantle them in a in a forensic manner to look at the directors see how many companies that those directors uh, have and had controlled which have all been cash burn uh, debt facilitated companies and understand under the you know under common sense you would say Blinking neck, if you had a, a credit card and you were 20 quid overdrawn month after month, you'd get called into the bank and they'd cut your card up. How come there's been no control over these so-called uh, politicians who are executives of these oil and gas companies that have never found any oil and gas? And then what you'd have to look at is who is accountable 
for bringing a, an investigation. And then you'd have to look at the Financial Conduct Authority, the FSA, or sorry, the FCA, and the Serious Fraud Office. Hence, um, as I said, I watch Sky TV and I watch, um, you know, police interceptors and they arrest people for stealing five bags of compost or, or driving without a, no, no insurance. These people are what I have always said to try and be polite. They're extracting the urine out of us and it needs to stop. There needs to be someone who has the gumption to stand up and start to dismantle this system, which is quite obvious, it's, but it's, uh, uh, it has many politicians who are protecting uh, what you call door slammers or uh, gate guards who are stopping this, like Chris Williamson. Chris Williamson. I, I mean, I, I've been to him so many times with my partner, and I'm not stupid. I recorded our conversations because I know it's a legal recording, and he should go to jail for misconduct in public office. And I'll say that openly on this show because, as I said, I'm an ex-serviceman and I really feel that when you start to expose organized crime of this level, this is uh, industrial organized crime and it's moving money out of this com country, which is badly needed by the NHS. It's badly needed by old age pensioners. I'm one. Give me some. And <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and many people, the doctors, the young nurses who, who struggle day to day, working their backsides off to make £10 an hour or £8 an hour. No, I've seen many veterans sleeping in doorways on cardboard. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not scared to stand up in front of anybody, and I will tell the truth as best as I know it. And if I can't find anybody to give me a reasonable answer to substantial evidence, then I will carry on. I don't care. Really, I don't care. I'm wouldn't, just trying my best. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to hold all these people to account and to take, you know, the criminal proceeds away from them and to actually be able to regenerate Great Britain? There's so many areas of, of suffering deprivation. You know, as you say about veterans sleeping on, not just veterans, once you fall out of the, you know, it's like being on a hamster wheel, isn't it? When you yeah. struggle with your bills, you have a bad time and then you get kicked out. And of course, housing is such a premium these days. If only we could regenerate Great Britain using the proceeds of crime. Well, we could. We could. If I've offered my services to the SFO, I've offered it to the police. Nobody wants to touch it because as soon as you start to mention the word Freemasons, everybody does a runner. I, you know, as I said, I'm not scared of anybody. They can threaten me. I've been threatened before. I've been shot at before. I don't, I don't really take into consideration who the Freemasons are. There's probably many, many Freemasons who legitimately believe that what they're doing uh, from the input side is an honorable thing. However, I have traced many Freemasons to their Masonic lodges who are running fake mining companies, who are cash burning. Let, let me give you an example, if I've got time. Anglesey Mining, PLC, it's not on the AIM, which is the uh, likely regulated st uh, stock exchange, a derivative of the main stock exchange. It's operated for 34 years are you getting this? 34 years and they haven't mined, you know, a, a ton of dirt. They sunk a shaft in uh, 1989 to 1991, which with my mining experience is an identical um, mine design for a nuclear waste repository. And they haven't done anything. Well, Gordon, that's, it is so shocking. I mean, we're, we're smiling, but it's actually... I'm smiling. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's devastating, especially for those people that have been involved. Gordon, have you got sort of a parting word or a few words to the audience listening today? Yeah, uh, as you always say, follow the money. And if you don't believe what I've said, you're more than welcome to come and have a look at my research. If you look on the far uh, right of your screen there, you'll see a bookcase. I've got four bookcases like that. 
full of A4 ring binder files to show exactly where the money's gone. I know exactly where it's gone. Anybody want any help? Anybody lost any money? Give me a shout. Thank you, Gordon. This is the first part of a two-part series. So I will look forward to interviewing you again very shortly. And in the meantime, to the people at home, thank you so much for listening. As you can see, uh, there's a two-tier system in this country. Uh, you've either got it or you haven't. And we want to make sure that everybody is equal in front of the law. Thank you for listening. And I hope to see you again on a Stepping Stones to Awareness show. Bye.